really delighted Jay could be here tonight. He's got a great story, and I'm not going to go into his bio because I want to hear, uh, I want you all to hear his story, but uh, he's been a great supporter of the Rothman Institute. He sits on our board. He also was um, the inaugural Immigrant Entrepreneur of the Year Award uh, winner this past November. This was uh, the first uh, year that we presented this, uh, this new award, and he was traveling, doing some business development overseas, and could not be here on November 20th to accept his, uh, his award. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just give it to him tonight. And, um, and Thank you very much. And I'll just, here you go. So I'll hold on to this. So good evening, everybody. Thank you to the Madison Tech uh, Meetup. Thank you to Jim, the FTU, for having me uh, come in and say a few words. I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'll just wave my hands. Um, in terms of uh, my intro, uh, I used to work at a company called DoubleClick. I used to build uh, products there, and uh, I worked there for five years, very early employee, uh, and then I quit to start Theorem in my spare bedroom in West Orange. So the genesis of that was you're all, you know, for the most part, a lot of entrepreneurs here. So the genesis was even though I'm a product guy at heart, I saw a need for a services company. And there's a lot of, you know, uh, innovation going on in the digital marketing space, the internet uh, advertising space. So I said, why not start a very specialized uh, technology services company that focuses on digital marketing and internet advertising. Uh, so that's what we do. So we do, you know, three things for our customers uh, in the digital marketing space. We, we build the actual ads uh, that run inside of mobile devices, inside of, inside of apps, uh, on websites. Uh, so we do the actual build. We take the storyboards, we take the mockups, and we build it that will run in an optimal way. Then we deploy campaigns at mass scale. We deploy campaigns on email, on social, on uh, mobile devices, obviously. So it's a very uh, deployment-heavy uh, services uh, activity. And the last piece is we do custom uh, analytics because there's a lot of data floating around. So we take those and we come up with very custom uh, analytics for our customers. So that's what we do. Uh, in the, in this year, one of the strategic uh, initiatives we've taken is to uh, launch the media activity. I don't know how many have uh, any of you heard of programmatic media buying and selling? Okay, so I'll get into that in a bit, but with the advent of programmatic media buying and you know, uh, selling, we are able to bundle the creation of an ad, deployment of a campaign, customer analytics, and come up with a new way of you know, doing uh, media. So that's our story. We have about 150 customers. There might be some names you recognize, like Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, Facebook. Uh, we have offices. Uh, I'm based in Chatham, New Jersey. We are moving to new offices in about 30 to 45 days. We'll hold about 100 plus people there, about 18,000 square foot. Offices in uh, the Dominican Republic in Santo Domingo. We need bilingual skills, uh, Spanish and uh, you know, hourly coverage uh, for Latin America and North America. We have an office in London to cover Europe, and we have offices in India. So it's a truly uh, global company. So that's the quick two-minute summary. Um, Can you speak a little louder? Sorry. Um, in terms of, um, I just want to uh, point out that we, uh, there are quite a few uh, people doing philanthropy and you know, local activities. So uh, Theorem has been active in supporting uh, local organizations and activities. We've been supporting the first Lego League in the Newark High School uh, for the last, I think, four or five years. Uh, we show up as a team, root for them. We have been, uh, I'm on the National Board of Advisors for Grameen America. How many of you have heard of Grameen America? So we do that. We've been very active in supporting their uh, opening of their branch office in uh, Jersey City. And plus we are always hiring from you know, local schools and colleges. So uh, we're very proud of that and just thought I'd mention it because it looks like you guys are you know, wired in as well. So uh, that's the theorem in a story. That's what we do for a living. Um, I just thought I would share some high-level observations in terms of uh, technology and entrepreneurship 
and do a little more deeper dive into digital marketing and uh, internet advertising to see, uh, to share some of the trends that uh, our business, our clients, and myself, we see. So on the broad strokes, I think um, this phrase, Internet of uh, Things, is actually getting more real in a very rapid way. So if you look at what Nest does in your houses, in terms of how it collects data, how it monitors and manages how you use your energy usage, that's a very powerful statement. Um, I test drove the Model S Tesla, and uh, it is fully Wi-Fi, wireless enabled and connected. So you actually have you know, internet in the car, which is live. Um, how many of you have seen the latest Littman uh, stethoscope? It used to be that boring you know, stethoscope. The latest, one of the latest models of the Littman stethoscope is uh, Bluetooth enabled. So what that does is uh, it will connect to your house wireless and the patient can plug it into his ear, hold it to the heart. It transmits the signal to the doctor via the ear internet using your Wi-Fi connectivity on the web. And when you want to speak to your doctor, you can take that, I don't know if you call it a mouthpiece, it's not a mouthpiece, but you can hold it in your mouth and you can speak to the doctor too. So it's pretty powerful. So, uh, the point here is uh, the connection between internet and machines is actually very powerful and it's becoming very real because if you look at the uh, chronic care, chronic, chronic patient care, it's one of the most uh, expensive things to maintain because of the distance communication. So using something as simple as a device that you can give to the user to use on themselves while having that very intimate connection with the doctor is very profile. So that's you know, happening soon, very r rather quickly. And that's just an example. The other big picture trend that has not spoken about as much as, let's say, uh, big data or cloud is the evolution of the user interface. Uh, user interface because we are now using you know, your tactile sensations uh, uh, as opposed to just a mouse, what that's doing is it's making technology very accessible to people who may not be computer savvy. And the user interface, if you look around, is changing. It's changing in medical devices. It's actually changing in the new cars because most of them are touch screens. So I don't think enough attention has been given to the evolution of user interface design and how it impacts uh, in a positive way for the most part uh, how people will interact with machines and it's very seamless because the kind of touch sensation right from a two, three-year-old to you know, senior citizens can engage with it. I'm trying to remind myself to hold the mic. I'm trying, but in case you can't hear me, just yell. Um, the other piece is I was talking to uh, a leading industrial design uh, firm and they, uh, here's another example of a good user interface design uh, productivity metric. They said they were engaged to fix the uh, controls in nuclear plants. So they had a string of nuclear, nuclear plants built at different times. So the controls in all these plants, because they were built at different points, were very, very different. So the training was, very, was taking too long in case they had a new person they had to you know, refer to manuals. But using touch screens and interface design, they managed to make it very intuitive and they could actually point to productivity gains in these plants in terms of how the users interacted with these machines. So those, those are real life examples that are uh, happening uh, today, right now. Uh, both interesting case studies on the apps, uh, very powerful stuff. Uh, on the app itself, you know, yes, there, there's a proliferation of apps, there are millions and millions of apps, it's a lot of noise. From a pure technology perspective, I think, uh, Apps gained traction because the browser was sucking wind. So the browser, if you look at what the browser has done, it's not actually evolved because nobody's invested the time uh, into making browser uh, user-friendly. Yeah, you have HTML5, there's new standards coming in, but overall, the browser innovation has been fairly lacking, and that may be one of the reasons you have all these custom apps that are a lot more user-friendly, but that's just an observation. It's really tough to, you know, have that kind of a rich 
uh, engagement within a browser. But I think if the browser starts to take hold, then you will start to see a lot more easier design that will run cross-platform as opposed to making it for iOS and Android. Uh, so those are the top two or three uh, areas that uh, I thought I would share with you. Um, diving in, um, I'll, I'll talk about maybe four or five trends in the digital marketing, internet advertising space. Uh, we build ads. We actually build the ads that run inside of browsers and you know, apps. So broad strokes, if you apply the 80-20 rule, 80% of the ads we build are on iOS and 20% on Android, which is reverse in terms of some of the metrics I heard right now. Because paid content, when it is consumed, has a higher threshold for quality of ads, and that is easier to manage in the iOS because of the uniformity of the device. So it is actually counterintuitive when you look at the stats because we always look at the stat in the context of what the story is. In our case, uh, we work with leading publishers like Condé Nast, Wall Street Journal, Hearst, and they are paid apps, so the ad itself needs to be of a certain quality. So in, in our experience, it is the inverse of what you are experiencing in the user engagement model. And within that, if you have to take the 80-20 rule again, 80% of the ads that we are building that is on paid content is running inside of iPad and the balance is on the iPhones because the consumption of content is higher in iPad because of the uh, display area. Um, the other thing is the, uh, the lines between display and mobile is blurring. Um, for the way I, dis uh, I define display is laptop, desktop, pure traditional browser-based versus mobile, which is more on the handheld devices. So uh, uh, until about maybe two, three years ago, uh, you could say broad strokes, you know, this is display, this is mobile, but now if you look at consumption of content, that is blurry, you know. So which brings me to the third point, which is uh, it's very tough to design content, design ads, or design a user experience across all these devices because you can't just sit and hand code and do it over and over again. So what we are seeing is uh, a fairly, I won't call it rapid, but it is gaining momentum where people are starting to do responsive design. So design it once, and then you can deploy and view it on any other de devices. So responsive design, HTML5 are going pretty much hand in hand. Um, the other piece is from a pure business model perspective, uh, depending on what you're doing with mobile devices, mobile by itself from a pure advertising is very difficult to monetize. Yes, you have the viewers, you have the adaption rate, uh, you have people spending time on it, but in terms of actually making money, monetizing it, it's really, really you know, tough and difficult. And that's why I think most of the publishing model is starting to struggle with it. Um, I'm sure there'll be time for questions after this. Okay. Um, and the last thing is, um, I was hearing the uh, a senior person, I don't know whether it was Pandora or Spotify, uh, speak, but streaming radio is making fast inroads. You know, you know, at, at work, I'm, I'm finding more people listening to radio, uh, either through Spotify, Pandora, um, I listen to iTunes Radio. Um, but what that's done is it has reinvigorated the radio genre. So now you have AM, FM, and SM, which is, you know, they're calling it streaming media, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. And you are actually having advertisers trying to buy spots on radio like they would buy in any other medium. But because now you're watching, excuse me, if you're listening to radio at your desk, in addition to listening to radio, you are able to see the visual ads. I don't know how it'll pan out, but it's, it's, it's very new. But now you can actually do spot buys on radio, and that's what the streaming radio companies are pitching, that you can actually do those spot buys uh, while you're stationary, uh, and you can actually do a visual piece of it. Um, the last one is, um, I mentioned programmatic 
the easiest way to uh, explain programmatic media planning and buying is uh, it is search applied to display ads. So you could buy a keyword on search engines, and, and it's an auction-based pricing model. So if the word car is more attractive or more in need for a Toyota, they'll bid it up as opposed to a Honda, and then the market sets the price for buying and selling that word. Um, that's happening in display. So if you want to reach a certain consumer with a certain behavior or a certain profile, you can cherry pick them as opposed to buying on CPM. So what that's done is it has made this very, very efficient. And it's like machines buying and selling very, very targeted uh, media. And what that does is you know, it brings the cost of media acquisition down, makes media very accessible. And that is changing the way online media, for all, both in display and mobile, to be very, very different and efficient. So those are like the broad strokes that we're seeing in the digital marketing and the uh, internet advertising space. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, we could spend the whole evening talking about startups. I love it. I'm engaged in quite a few. Um, I like the energy. I like the buzz. I like the vibe. Um, the only thing I would encourage you guys to think about when you do the startup is the monetization. You know, I know it's very t difficult to raise money. It's difficult to build products, take it to market. Um, technology by technology's sake is seldom useful. It's the value. And if you create the value, very quickly start to think about monetization. So in, in my industry, internet advertising or digital media, and if you can layer in technology, there are pretty much three ways you can make money if you cut to brass tacks. One is licensing. The other is subscription, like your apps were subscription-based. Uh, if it's a software, it's licensing. But again, the licensing model is getting fragmented between getting hosted on the, on the cloud. And the last one is ad supported, or a mix of all of them. So uh, the streaming radios are doing a mix of free premiums with running ads. Uh, you could use the same, th same thing where you could have syndicated content running inside of the app if somebody's looking for shoes or something. So a combination of licensing, syndicated, uh, syndication, or excuse me, subscription, or advertising model are pretty much the three. So the sooner you start to zone in on how you plan to monetize your value, the better it is. That's it. That's my story. All right, we got a quick hand up there. Uh, no. Uh, sorry. Uh, are there any stats for people who will opt out of ads versus pay for the content? That's the question. Um, I don't know the numbers, but I suspect it will be different based on the content itself. Um, I will not pay for radio. Okay, I'm cheap. That's just what it is. But I know a lot of guys at work, they're very fussy. They'll say, and I don't mind the ads. You know, I, uh, ironically, I'm in the ad business, but I block an ad off, so <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Uh, but at work, uh, if I split the population, the more recent college graduates are very fussy. Some guys mix music, they say Spotify, and they'll pay $9.99. So that's just an example. So if you look at the content, the category, I think that number will change. Uh, uh, yes, I am. So the question is, how do we deal with um, web extensions like Adblock? Uh, that is something the owner of the content will need to deal with. Uh, we create the ad. And, no. <laughs> um, I mean, you could. <laughs> well, if I'm the owner of the content, then I would be very hesitant to piss people off. 
So the short answer is I won't try that. There are other ways to discourage people mm. from paying for content. I can tell you annoying ads may not be high up there. So how, how long did it take you to get your first customers? And when did you get the sense that you had something that was worth pursuing? <clears throat> the question is, how long did it take uh, Theorem to get the first uh, customer? And uh, uh, when did I think it would, the baby had legs and it will you know, start to take off? Um, 24 hours. <laughs> I quit double click and they were my first client. So uh, that's the short answer, but that's an unfair answer. Uh, it took a year for other clients to come in. Um, but then you may have a client, but will they pay for it? Okay, so two different things. Do you have a client? Yes. Are they paying for it? It took a while to generate the revenue, which segues into your second question, uh, and which also ties back to my comment about value. If there is tangible value, whatever that might be, that is recognizable, then it's easy to charge. And so the, for the first year, it was less revenue, it was the value, right? Are you happy? Are we responding to you? Are our SLAs up to your you know, satisfaction? So by focusing on that satisfaction and the value, then we said, okay, now you've got to start paying us. And my philosophy is the market sets price. You don't set the price. You know, eventually economics takes over, whether you're selling you know, cookies, streaming radio, music, whether you're offering service. The value you create will determine what you can charge. And that's when you do the math and then you start to scale it up. It's easier to do it in services, less on the technology where the upfront cost is you know, fairly significant. But I, if I had to start a tech business, I would use the same methodology, which is focus on the value and then look at the revenue next. Yes? Did you start your business on the technology analytics side or the creative side? Or uh, great question. The question is, <coughs> of the three services, what did we start with? We started with deployment because it is a recurring problem. Campaign start, campaign ends. Campaign start, optimize it, campaign ends. So when one ends, the other begins. So there was that uh, ongoing need if you will. So we focused on that. The se when, when you did the, once we did that, because we were so close to the process, then the next logical thing was, hey, I need some help with custom analytics because not telling me the answer, we diversified into that. The actual ad build is the last thing because it is, only in the last four years was the need for high-end ads that ran inside mobile started to come up. And because it is not a ongoing need, at scale it is. But in the early days, it would be tricky. So that's the rationale, and that's how we start. Go ahead. The speaker of MM said that we haven't got people because we haven't started spending money on ad tech. So how would you, as a consultant, <coughs> advise them to spend money on your services? Um, well, it's up to them if they want to run ads, and they Okay, so the pro I think the question is, how does MM get traction, right? How do you get word of mouth? That, that's probably, um, I think because it is a very, it's a fairly niche product, right? So you have, you're targeting children, so let's say you're an eight, nine, 10 year old until 15, 16, once they go to college, you know, they are off. So it depends, so you narrow that down. And then I would say guerrilla marketing, word of mouth, yeah, evangelism, because it's a very specific value and the advertising is too broad, unless you have you know, websites, blogs, you know, the appropriate way to reach those uh, uh, audiences. It's a very fragmented market, so that's why just blanket advertising may not be economically so possible. So startups should not be using services like yours? They should be doing websites and blogs? We, uh, I wouldn't say that. Um, for that specific reason, yes. Uh, ours may not be the appropriate choice. We do have a lot of startups. Uh, in fact, we have a long tail of very cutting edge, innovative startup companies and rich media. Uh, they're doing a lot of uh, uh, curated content. So yes, we do use startups. But for them, the display advertising is so core that it makes sense to tap into us. But the other ways to get the word out instead of doing display 
And that's why our services specifically may not really make sense. Happy to talk. <laughs> that's my sales pitch kicking in. I was resisting for the first seven, 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Kelly. So, so the, uh, the internet of things, a lot of people talk about that in terms of you know, it's, it's going to be sending lots of data out. So how do you see it affecting your business in terms of are we now going to be getting ads through the stethoscopes and on our... It doesn't, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think the question is how does the internet of things with machines talking to each other affect our business? I don't think uh, we need to worry about that yet. In our case, it is the sheer variety of different devices out there that affects our business uh, because that has a di direct impact on how the ad renders and how the user interacts with the ad. So it's less about machines talking to each other, but anything that's ad specific, which is very device dependent, uh, matters. Uh, you know, there's some databases there that track, you know, by manufacturer, by model number, screen resolution, but it's too tedious. You know, there's no single standard, standardization, and I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yeah, uh, are we doing any, the question is, uh, are we doing anything with big data in our business? Uh, not big data per se, it depends on how you define big data, but I'll tell you, uh, sometimes we analyze uh, cookie level data in ad server logs to do attribution. So if you saw four ads, but you went to the site and you made the purchase, doesn't mean the ads didn't play a role, right? So how do you tie that together? So yes, we touch granular data. You could call that big data because the sheer volume of the data. But uh, to your point, yes, Online advertising, digital marketing is creating a lot of data uh, constantly being you know, overlaid. Yes, we do that. Are you concerned about uh, privacy implications of, of the data collection? It doesn't affect our business because we don't own the content. We are you know, fairly removed from managing the content. Uh, but from a, from a content owner standpoint, yeah, it is actually, you know, Privacy is affecting everybody at every level. So it's in the grand scheme of things, uh, the cynic in me says, privacy related to ads is the least of our problems. We have other more urgent privacy related issues that may affect our, how we live as opposed to an ads. Uh, but in terms of direct impact, the industry is fairly mature. Uh, we have the IAB that has um, uh, some standards in place. Uh, most publishers have good privacy policies in place. So from a industry monitoring standpoint, it's very mature because that's the livelihood. Um, it, and it's always been uh, a challenge. How do you do advertising while respecting people's privacy? towards the middle. Uh, the question is, when do you start to use um, overseas resources? Clients ask for it because campaigns could run globally, so you need to track them. Um, uh, it was probably towards the middle because in the early days, you have to be client side, you understand their needs, understand their requirements, communication is a challenge. So I think all businesses are global. You know, if you look at most businesses, whether they're Fortune, 500,000, even small to mid, it's truly a global economy because, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the broader question should be, uh, what skills are you looking for? Where are they available? Does the communication and quality balance the cost? Yes, the cost may be lower, but you've got to give something up. Um, how do you do training? How do you do communication? How do you manage quality? And uh, dealing with the HR problems, HR challenges, uh, good, both the good and the bad. Uh, how do you motivate, which is a challenge? How do you create a career path? So you've got to balance it out. But in, uh, if you're speaking of startup, keep it close. Keep it very close to you, the teams, because in the early days, 
through osmosis you learn, you share information. And distance matters, you know, it starts to get watered down. So for the appropriate task, you may want to look at remote skills. I call them remote because there's some skills that we may not get in Jersey, but we used to have an office in Las Vegas uh, because we found skills there. So anywhere in the world you find skills, you can go there. More questions? <laughs> go ahead. Um, it's my sales pitch. <laughs> you lined it up. <laughs> um, what are the company's um, uh, strengths? Um, domain expertise. It's a very new industry. It's very fast evolving. It's very innovative. So it's not just knowing HTML5. It's knowing the technology in the context of the business. Uh, it's not just building an ad. It is what is the ad for. So that expertise, both technical and business savvy, scale, the teams that I spoke about, both client-facing in terms of understanding the client needs, but the global you know, support, it could range from multilingual support in Europe to 24-7 you know, coverage, so all of the above. Um, the East Coast is competitive because if you look at the concentration of tech companies, it starts all the way from, let's say, the Boston area, which is very heavily funded in terms of VC activity. Same with New York. In fact, New York has made a very strong comeback uh, in terms of coming up with really strong tech companies. Uh, Jersey strong in telecom, then you go all the way down to Virginia. So that's your belt. Um, I think that if you position your company well, you are able to attract talent in Jersey to stay in Jersey because you see a lot of reverse commuters. I was talking to people before that there's a lot of talent going into the city because it's more concentrated there. But if you're able to create a quality you know, company in terms of experience and uh, the uh, career path, I think there's enough talent in, uh, in Jersey. Uh, so the question is, are there any other places on the globe which has you know, got the advantage in terms of skills and talent? Uh, I think uh, Latin America is immensely talented before we settled on uh, Dominican Republic, which by the way we were, we were very pleased with. Um, I, I didn't go to, but I looked at countries like Panama, Puerto Rico, but they're very expensive, uh, Costa Rica. Uh, we had uh, other competitors there, but all that, the whole region has got very good school system, bilingual, and you have to know English to graduate. Uh, there's a very good tech focus. Uh, Costa Rica is big. In fact, Microsoft has got a massive uh, R&D facility in Costa Rica. When it comes to creative talent, Uruguay, Argentina, and Brazil are very big. The holding companies have a lot of uh, big production centers there in terms of print design and graphic design. So uh, Asia takes the limelight but actually Latin America is pretty good and good bandwidth too because off Central America, I think that's where the fiber optics crisscross and that's why you had a concentration of call centers there. That's All right, it. maybe, is there one more? All right, good. All right, guys, thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. That was fantastic.